PlayStation Store, of course. Buttons a little high on these headphones. Walter, Walter, and Bobby Ralph, Walter Emerson. Especially for like eight bucks, I think. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and to discover that I had not lived. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to reduce it to its lowest terms, and, if it proved to be mean, to get the whole and genuine meanness of it, or if it were sublime, to know it by experience, and to give a true account of it. Look at the cottage. Okay. Seek out the glittering arrowheads. The first one. When I wrote the following pages, or rather the bulk of them, I lived alone in the woods, a mile from any neighbor, in a house which I had built myself on the shore of Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts, and earned my living by the labor of my hands only. Huh. When I first took up my abode in the woods, my house was not finished. It was a pleasant hillside where I worked, covered with pine woods, through which I looked out on the pond and a small open field in the woods where pines and hickories were springing up. July 4th, 1845. Dearest Henry, congratulations on the start of your experiment. I hope that the work goes well and the ideas are fruitful. Mr. Emerson says you are intent to devour yourself in our woods, but I hope that you will remember to take good care and keep yourself well. Mother worries, as do I. Your loving sister, Sophia. My residence was more favorable, not only to thought, but to serious reading than a university. And though I was beyond the range of the ordinary circulating library, I had more than ever come within the influence of those books which circulate round the world.
I am fully rested. Does that mean I can go back and do a wall and a roof? How old was Emerson when he did this? This guy's voice sounds really young. You know, you kind of think of. <laughs> oh, man, maybe it's me. <laughs> Got a cute little house. What we got? Yeah. July, eighteen forty-five. Dear Mr. Thorough. My employer, Dr. Agassi, How was happy was to meet you last month with Mr. Emerson and was quite impressed with your knowledge of local biology. He wonders if you might be able to provide some specimens Sorry, for him to, to use in his work. Dr. Agassi would gladly come to Concord to collect such specimens himself, but is drawn away by numerous and pressing engagements. If you are amenable to this idea, we will soon send you requests for these items and are happy to pay you for your trouble. Sincerely, James Elliot Cabot, assistant to Dr. Agassiz, Harvard University. There is some of the same fitness in a man's building his own house that there is in a bird's building its own nest. Who knows, but if men constructed their dwellings with their own hands and provided food for themselves and families simply and honestly enough, the poetic faculty would be universally developed as birds universally Is there a map or okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I go fishing. The grand necessity, then, for our bodies is to keep warm, to keep the vital heat in us. When I was four years old, as I well remember, I was brought from Boston to this my native town, through these very woods in this field, to the pond. It is one of the oldest scenes stamped on my memory, and now tonight my flute has waked the echoes over that very water. I think at night time you need to go chill. My house was on the side of a hill, immediately on the edge of the larger wood, in the midst of a young forest of pitch pines and hickories, and half a dozen rods from the pond, to which a narrow footpath led down the hill. In my front yard grew the strawberry, blackberry, and life everlasting, 
John's wart and goldenrod, shrub oaks and sand cherry, blueberry and groundnut. This is really nice. The necessaries of life for man in this climate may, accurately enough, be distributed under the several heads of food, shelter, clothing, and fuel. For not till we have secured these are we prepared to entertain the true problems of life with freedom and a prospect of success. Hmm. Good night. What are you doing now? Emerson asked. Do you keep a journal? So I make my first entry today. July 1845. My dear Henry, Mr. Emerson has assisted my family in acquiring a house near Concord, and there we are now, riding and living like philosophers, which is to say with little but happily. I will visit you soon and bring Mr. Garrison of the Liberator. We have all been so inspired by his earnest and unequivocal writings regarding the moral stain of slavery on our nation. Perhaps he will speak at our lyceum on the topic. Yours truly, A. Bronson Alcott. Hmm. played video games pretty much my entire life. I just left. Trying to go to bed, man. Just like walking around at night with a lantern. There's a bear coming sometimes. Yeah, it's just... July 1845. Dear Henry, you've told me yourself that it is difficult to begin anything without borrowing, and I know that you can win my front yard by the chopping stump. Do come by any time to fetch it. Perhaps we can discuss the new lecture I am working on while you are here. Your friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson.
more lonely than the loon in the pond that laughs so loud, or than Walden Pond itself. I am no more lonely than a single mullion or dandelion in a pasture, or a bean leaf, or a sorrel, or a horsefly, or a bumblebee. I am no more lonely than the millbrook, or a weathercock, or the north star, or the south wind, or an April shower, or a January thaw, or the first spider in a new house. Okay, so I've got to go to my left. I never found the companion that was so companionable as solitude. A man thinking or working is always alone. Let him be where he will. Solitude is not measured by the miles of space that intervene between a man and his fellows. Often, in the repose of my midday, there reaches my ears a confused tin tenebulum from without. It is the noise of my contemporaries. My neighbors tell me of their adventures with famous gentlemen and ladies, what notabilities they met at the dinner table. But I am no more interested in such things than in the contents of the Daily Times. 
The interest and the conversation are about costume and manners chiefly, but a goose is a goose still, dress it as you will. It's very good to make your acquaintance, Mr. Thoreau. Your sister seems to believe our thoughts and philosophies are very much aligned. It is good to find a youth so interested in the finer fruits of thought. Dear Miss Fuller, it was a pleasure to meet you and thank you for the introductions to such brilliant new company. I am sure that writers such as these will fill our new journal with rays of golden talent. I have another name to add to the roster of our dial. Mr. Henry David Thoreau, a fine, brave youth of this town from whom I expect great things. I will send you some of his work soon. My son Recommendation for Henry David Thoreau. I cordially recommend Mr. Henry D. Thoreau, a graduate of Harvard University in August 1837, to the confidence of such parents or guardians as may propose to employ him as an instructor. I have the highest confidence in Mr. Thoreau's moral character and in his intellectual ability. He is an excellent scholar, a man of energy and kindness, and I shall esteem the town fortunate that secures his services. R. Waldo Emerson. Oh, Henry, how goes your new experiment? Has genius... Yes, in fact, the experiment is going quite well. Excellent to hear. I do look forward to reading your new work. I hope you're keeping a good journal, full of your insights about life in the woods. Certainly. Well, thank you. I know you're quite busy with your own work, but I need help finding my copy of Homer's Iliad. I saw that you were reading it down by a new... Yes, I have seen it and can get it for you. Oh, that's wonderful. When you come... I look forward to it. Goodbye for now. Henry, there you are. Hello. Thank you. 
Our whole life is startlingly moral. There is never an instant's truce between virtue and vice. Goodness is the only investment that never fails. Wishing to earn ten or twelve dollars by some honest and agreeable method, in order to meet my unusual expenses, I planted about two acres and a half of light and sandy soil, chiefly with beans. What shall I learn of beans or beans of me? I cherish them, I hoe them. Early and late, I have an eye to them, and this is my day's work. I kept Homer's Iliad on my table through the summer, though I looked at his page only now and then. growing weeds, yeah. Uh... 
In the course of the summer, it appeared by the arrowheads, which I turned up in hoeing, that an extinct nation had anciently dwelt here. Hmm. Kids playing all day. Hello. Good afternoon. Oh, you found my home. Yes, I've read it. Well, that's good. I'd hoped you would, and that it would give you inspiration. Your experiment reminds me of the image of... Yes, I have seen it and can get it for you. Oh, that's wonderful. When you come back, we can discuss the... Past. I look forward to it. Goodbye for now. I do say fishing, but since I'm supposed to be from the south. Thank <laughs> you. 
Books are the treasured wealth of the world and the fit inheritance of generations and nations. Books, the oldest and the best, stand naturally and rightfully on the shelves of every cottage. Confucius said, to know that we know what we know, and that we do not know what we do not know, that is true knowledge. Every day or two I stroll to the village to hear some of the gossip which is incessantly going on there, circulating either from mouth to mouth or from newspaper to newspaper, and which, taken in homeopathic doses, was really as refreshing in its way as the rustle of leaves and the peeping of frogs. Ah, you found it. Yes, I've read it. Well, that's good. I'd hoped you would and that it would give you inspiration. Your experiment reminds me quite a bit of what Confucius says about needing only coarse rice for food, water to drink. I haven't seen it, but I can look for it. Wonderful. Let that shouldn't be difficult to find. I'll see you again soon. Was that, yeah, Good afternoon. Cheerio. Good afternoon. Men have become the tools of their tools. The man who independently plucked the fruits when he was hungry has become a farmer, and he who stood under a tree for a shelter, a housekeeper. We now no longer camp as for a night, but have settled down on earth and forgotten heaven.
Many men walk by day, few walk by night. It is a very different season. Chancing to take a memorable walk by moonlight some years ago, I resolved to take more such walks and make acquaintance with another side of nature. about trains in 1845 when I learned that it would cost incredibly little trouble to obtain one's necessary food, even in this latitude, that a man may use as simple a diet as the animals, and yet retain health and strength. Here in the woods, I live in each season as it passes, breathe the air, drink the drink, taste the fruit, and resign myself to the influence of the earth.